how is it that you, a human, are both an ape and a monkey? We all know that in a colloquial sense, monkeys are primates with tails and apes are bigger primates without tails. But in a biological sense, things get trickier. So is it biologically wrong to call a human a monkey? Or a chimp a monkey for that matter? This brings to light one of the most misunderstood concepts in biology, that of the nested hierarchy. hierarchies refer to the nested nature of categorization that life tends to follow due to evolution. Let's illustrate how a nested hierarchy works using a list of extant or still living organisms. In this group, we have numerous vague creatures, paramecium, snail, fish, snake, skunk, baboon, gibbon, and chimp. For our purposes, it doesn't matter the species of snail or fish, whether they are garden snails or alligator gar, and in the same way, it doesn't matter what species of chimp, gibbon, or baboon we're using. You'll see what I mean later. Some of these critters are very different from one another, are they not? So let's begin with step one. Let's see what traits all of these organisms share or have in common. All of these organisms have one or more cells that are nucleated, and those nuclei are enveloped in a nuclear envelope. These two traits separate every organism on this list from both archaea and bacteria, the other two domains of life, and it makes every one of these organisms a eukaryote, or members of the domain eukarya. But what other traits do these creatures have? All of the organisms utilize oxygen to respire and are capable of movement and sexual reproduction. They consume other organic material to survive. But snails, fish, snakes, skunks, baboons, gibbons, and chimps additionally have a developmental period where they form a multicellular blastula, or a hollow tube of cells. This makes them animals, or members of the kingdom Animalia. The paramecium splits off from the other organisms here because it's a unicellular protist instead. Now keep in mind, all of the organisms are still members of the domain eukarya as they still possess that suite of traits that denotes that category. However, the paramecium suite separates it from the other seven organisms at the second taxonomic level because they all share the suite that denotes animalia. Snails are the next to go. Snails lack the suite of characteristics that unite the fish, snakes, skunks, baboons, gibbons, and chimps. That is to say, they lack a hollow nerve cord that is located dorsally with a notochord found ventrally, gill slits that are developmentally found in the pharynx, and a post-anal tail as well as a ventral heart. This makes all of these organisms chordates, or members of the phylum chordata. Snails instead belong to the phylum mollusca. They are united with other mollusks like squid and clams. They all have soft and non-segmented bodies, gill-like structures called tenidia, and three unique regions of their bodies. All of the organisms beside the paramecium are still animals, as they still have that suite that denotes that kingdom. And all of the organisms, including the paramecium, are still eukaryotes, because they all have that suite as well. But while snails are eukaryotic animals and mollusks, fish, snakes, skunks, baboons, gibbons, and chimps are eukaryotic animals and chordates instead. This is starting to feel a bit like a Russian nesting doll, no? 
That's why it's called a nested hierarchy. At the next level, class, we see a split that separates our remaining critters into three groups. Some of the animals, the skunk, baboon, gibbon, and chimpanzee, have a large neocortex and a corpus callosum, utilize endothermy, have three auditory ossicles, or ear bones, possess a four-chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles, and also have a dentary squamosal joint. These traits, along with many others that I have not listed here, make them all mammals, or members of the class Mammalia. The fish instead has rays versus digits, and these rays are connected by fibrous tissue. Most fish are overwhelmingly ectothermic and only have one atrium and one ventricle, lacking three inner ear bones as well. Additionally, they have leptoid organoid scales. These traits, among others, make them actinopterygians, or members of the class Actinopterygii. Snakes, on the other hand, are reptiles. They, like their kin in crocodiles, birds, lizards, and extinct dinosaurs, utilize beta-carotene in their scales, have three to four chambered hearts, and a wide variety of metabolic systems. They produce no milk or milk analogs, unlike mammals, which is why they fall into the clade Sauropsida, which unites the Linnaean classes of Reptilia and Aves. It's important to note here that we're talking about suites of characteristics that define each hierarchical level, right? Crocodiles, for instance, have four-chambered hearts, just like mammals. Does that make them mammals? No, because they lack the entire suite of traits that makes mammals unique from sauropsids. And they have the traits that make sauropsids unique from mammals. Mammals, actinopterygians, and sauropsids all still have the suite of traits that necessitate them as eukaryotes, animals, and chordates. This means these animals share an incredible number of traits overall. However, at the class level, suites emerge that makes each group unique from one another. This is how the further specification of organisms allows us to create the nested hierarchies. Within mammalia, we can further separate out our animals. While skunks, baboons, gibbons, and chimps all share the suites of characteristics that make them eukaryotes, animals, chordates, and mammals, they now diverge here as well. Baboons, gibbons, and chimps each have binocular color vision, grasping dexterous hands, large brains for their body size, and highly flexible shoulder girdles, among others. This makes them all primates, or members of the order primates. The fact that all three of these primates lacks a prehensile tail, has a 2123 dental formula, and has nostrils that point downward instead of sideways means that they are specifically Old World monkeys, or members of the parv order Catarrhini. Skunks, on the other hand, have carnassial teeth, large auditory bulla and large turbinals, as well as a sagittal crest, simple stomachs, and strong zygomatics. This makes them carnivorans, or members of the order Carnivora. Skunks are additionally omnivorous, with non-retractable claws and a single-chambered auditory bulla, meaning that they are specifically dog-like carnivorans, or members of the parv order Caniforma. Like primates, skunks are still mammals, but they cannot be considered primates, let alone catarite primates, because they lack many of the traits that denote the order primates. And they have the traits that denote the order carnivora. Taking it further within the order primates, we can see that gibbons and chimps possess a more mobile shoulder located dorsally, as well as a larger brain for their body size than other primates. They have a Y5 molar pattern on their third molars and even more reduced caudal vertebra. They have orthogoid posture, allowing for occasional or frequent bipedality, the fusion of the frontal bone of the skull, unique sinuses, and a post-orbital constriction. These traits make gibbons and chimps both apes, or members of the hominoid superfamily. Baboons lack these traits. They possess a shoulder that is more built for quadrupedalism, bilophodont molars, and more prominent tails. This makes them cercopithecoids, or members of the superfamily Cercopithecoidea. Gibbons and chimps, while they share far more with one another than either does with baboons, can be separated out by their suites as well. Gibbons have long arms for their body size in order to brachiate at high speeds. They have enormous canine teeth, which can be found in both sexes, reflecting the entire family's sexual monomorphism. They have a deep cleft between their first and second digits, as well as robust hyoid bones. This makes them lesser apes, or members of the family Hylobatidae. Chimps, on the other hand, have enormous brains for their body sizes, longer gestations, hands which are partially adapted for tool use, and they are sexually dimorphic, although only moderately more so than gibbons and significantly less than their gorilla and orangutan cousins. This makes chimps great apes, or members of the family Hominidae. 
In this demonstration, we've only taken chimpanzees and gibbons all the way to the family level, but we could do the same thing with skunks, snails, snakes, etc. What we showed, though, is how different levels of hierarchical classification organize organisms, and how it is the number of hierarchical suites shared that denotes relatedness in a Linnaean sense, not any one characteristic. Spider monkeys, for example, brachiate much like gibbons do, and they similarly have a body plan that is very gibbon-like, much more so than that of a chimp. But while they share all the primate traits with gibbons, spider monkeys are instead platyrine monkeys, meaning they lack the catarine, ape, and lesser ape characteristics. This means overall, gibbons share far more with chimps than spider monkeys do. And genetic work, or phylogeny, recapitulates this. So, suites of characteristics can help us organize organisms, and when in conjunction with genetics, we can create family trees. This relies on a single assumption, that Mendel's laws of inheritance do not stop arbitrarily at any one point. So, what if we replace gibbons with humans? Where would our species fall using this objective criteria of physical traits, as Linnaeus would? Humans have nucleated cells enveloped in a nuclear membrane, so we do indeed join the domain of eukarya. We also utilize oxygen to respire, are capable of movement and sexual reproduction, and consume other organic material to survive, much like snails, fish, snakes, skunks, baboons, gibbons, and chimps. We additionally have a developmental period where we form a multicellular blastula, or that hollow tube of cells. So we join the kingdom of Animalia. Humans also have a hollow nerve cord that is located dorsally with a notochord found ventrally, gill slits developmentally found in the pharynx, a post-anal tail, and of course a ventral heart. So we fall into the phylum chordata. We also have a large neocortex and a corpus callosum, we utilize endothermy, have three auditory ossicles, or ear bones, possess a four-chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles, and we have a dentary squamosal joint. These traits, among many others that I have not listed, make us mammals, or members of the class Mammalia, just like the skunk, baboon, gibbon, and chimp. Humans also have binocular color vision, dexterous grasping hands, large brains for our body sizes, and highly flexible shoulder girdles. This makes us primates, or members of the order primates. The fact that we also lack a prehensile tail, have a 2-1-2-3 dental formula, and have nostrils that point downward instead of sideways means that we are specifically old world monkeys, or members of the parv order Caterini. Like gibbons and chimps, but unlike baboons, we possess a more mobile shoulder, located more dorsally, as well as a larger brain for our body size than other primates. We have a Y5 molar pattern on our third molars, and even more reduced caudal vertebra, as well as an orthograde posture that allows for bipedality. We have the fusion of the frontal bone of the skull, unique sinuses, and post-orbital constriction. These traits make us, just like gibbons and chimps, apes, or members of the hominoid superfamily. But humans, like other hominids, have enormous brains for our body sizes, even within the superfamily. We have long gestations and hands that are, of course, partially adapted for tool use. We are only slightly sexually dimorphic, less than chimps, but more than gibbons, and we are significantly less dimorphic than our gorilla and orangutan cousins. This makes humans great apes, or members of the family hominidae. Once again, this is recapitulated by whole genome comparative work, which shows conclusively that humans are most closely related to panins, like chimps and bonobos, followed by gorillas, then orangutans, then gibbons, then baboons, and then the rest of the primates in that order. All primates are more closely related to each other than any is to any living carnivoran, rodent, or proboscidean, and all mammals are more closely related to each other than any is to a living bird or snake. All animals are more closely related to each other than any is to a plant or a mushroom, and all eukaryotes are more closely related to each other than any is to a bacteria. This is the nature of the nested hierarchy, and whether we're using morphology or genetics, humans hash out as eukaryotes, animals, chordates, mammals, primates, catarines, hominoids, hominids, and homo sapiens. We are eukaryotic animalian, chordatan, mammalian, primate, monkey, ape, great apes, and I think that is pretty cool.